Number 68, the people of the state of New York versus Theodore Wilson. Good afternoon. Could I have two minutes for rebuttal, please? Yes, you may. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Mark W. Vorking of Appellate Advocates for Appellant Theodore Wilson. Your Honors, the evidence of depraved indifference was insufficient in this one-on-one -on -one confrontation involving an adult victim to convict. So why, why doesn't the, the analysis that's at the heart of Trapier sort of guide us here, that you've got two results that you're going towards, even though it's one individual? Why, why can't that analysis apply? We are not raising a repugnancy claim, and a repugnancy claim is not before this court. Um, the single issue before this court, well, two issues are raised, but as a well, What difference does that make that it happened to be in the posture of a repugnancy claim? Well, I think because you Why you're, doesn't the analysis still apply? Because the evolution of this court's depraved indifference jurisprudence shows that a willingness to act, that it requires a willingness to act not to cause harm. Um, and I think as this court put it in Taylor, um, when the conscious objective of the defendant is an intent to harm, um, that negates or cannot support a finding All of those cases up to Feingold came out of a scenario where it was a depraved indifference murder and it was a deadly weapon. So it was a knife or a gun. They were charged with intentional murder and depraved indifference and there was an acquittal on the intentional murder and the concern of the court was depraved indifference was being used as a sort of lesser included when really what it was was a substitute for intent. Feingold is a very different case because of the findings by the bench and the bench trial. But this is an assault, and it's not an assault with a deadly weapon. And you apply Feingold's requirement that depraved indifference is a mens rea, but you don't have that inherent, and I think this perhaps is what Judge Rivera is getting at as well, you don't have that inherent tension with the death. So it seems to me we're purely looking at sufficiency here. So we accept now under fine goal, depraved indifference is not an objective circumstance, it's a mens rea. But if we're just purely looking at sufficiency and applying, looking at the proof as we must in the light most favorable to the government here, the people, why doesn't this easily pass? Because you could have someone who engages in this type of conduct and it's brutally described graphic detail in the papers, who creates a grave risk of death under circumstances showing this defendant didn't really care one way or another if this victim died, leading to serious physical injury. And that's really all we're looking at. And we don't have that lesser included offense concern that you have in depraved indifference. And we don't have the type of weapon that was being used in those cases, which raises that concern of how can you be indifferent and shoot somebody five times in the heart? Several responses, Your Honor, to that. Um, I think first is that this case, I think, does implicate precisely the questions that arose in Feingold and in erode in pre-Feingold cases like Chan Sanchez, like even Register, because this was the case that always was prosecuted as an intentional crime. But that goes, I think, to what they were saying. You would then be arguing there's an inconsistent verdict here because unlike all those cases, Feingold back and Feingold forward, you have convictions for intentionally inflicting serious bodily injury here and a depraved indifference. And your argument isn't that those are inconsistent. Well, I think that this, I think one additional factor is that yet, Trapier stands for what it says. Of course, the counts at issue in Trapier are distinguishable from those here. Trapier involved an attempted first degree assault um, and a first degree reckless endangerment, neither of which I think in effect had a practical actus rea. Um, really, this court was grappling with the sort of different causes involved in those counts. And I think while Carter, this court sort of addressed Trapier, it left open the question whether or not um, the mens rea is at issue here, um, depraved indifference and an intent to cause serious physical injury are in fact inconsistent. So I just would put out there that it's an open and question. They may be. They may be. But this isn't the case where there is an assault, depraved indifference assault conviction. They were acquitted of intent. So you're saying, well, how can you be acquitted of intent? Because the only intentional harm, the attempted murder, intent to kill, he was acquitted of. We're not saying you were acquitted of this intentional crime, and now you're using depraved indifference to get the same result. I, you actually have a consistent verdict I, here. I disagree, Your Honor. I think, I think it bears mention, of course, that the appellant was acquitted of first-degree intentional assault as well. That just means they didn't find he used a deadly weapon. Here, which you can see on this proof, this, the elements are exactly the same except for the deadly weapon and the second-degree assault. So he's convicted of intentionally 
causing serious bodily injury, and he's convicted of depraved indifference. Well, I think two additional points. Um, one is that the only injury, and I think I don't think the people would dispute this, um, that posed a risk of death, risk of death, of course, being a prerequisite to a finding of depraved indifference, was the diffuse exogonal brain injury. So wouldn't that make this more like Barboni? In, in what respect, Your Honor? Well, the nature of the industries, it's a, in, injuries, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, all the proof is circumstantial. Um, the only difference I see between this case and Barboni is Bar Barboni was an infant victim and this victim was an adult. I, I, I don't see any other real difference. Well, I, I, I think that's true, Your Honor, and, I, and let, me, let, let me get to that in a second. But I think Bar Barboni is, I think, interesting and responsive to Judge Garcia's question as well, because one of the points raised by the defendant in Barboni was my conduct was intentional. Um, I shouldn't have been acquitted, I shouldn't have been convicted of depraved indifference murder. And this court, I think, could have addressed or could have responded to that argument by raising Trappier and saying these are not inconsistent mens reas. But in fact, this court held that while his conduct may have been voluntary, um, it nonetheless was reckless. And because it was reckless, he... Um, it, he falls it, within the category. Then this precisely. Right. And I think so, that so in this case, then, doesn't our analysis follow that Barboni path? It seems to be that we're down that particular line of jurisprudence. I, I think not, and I think, I think that's why the brain injury, I think, is relevant here, because he, of course, would have to appreciate that that injury was in play and then been reckless to the risk of death involved. So you're saying that he wasn't aware that, that, he, that he had created a grave risk. And I think and that- And unlike, unlike Barboni, where you're saying he was aware. And I think that the, no re, that the only reasonable reading of the record is that no one could have been aware of, that the EMTs were not aware of it when they responded, and the medical examiner, I think the medical medical expert who testified said that this injury, because it affected um, the complainant's ability to breathe, would have resulted in death within an hour. I think that the only conclusion to be drawn no, from I, that I had Barboni at the fourth department. I was on that panel. And um, um, it, it's, it seemed to me that the defendant said similar things. I can't quote the record now. It's been about it's five or six years. But um, it, 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 as I recall, the circumstances were almost identical. Um, in terms of the defendant's posture, except for the allegations of mental illness. There was no allegation of mental illness in Barboni. There is some here, so. I, I think there are allegations, but I would dispute that there's a specific finding of mental illness. But I think the, my final response to Judge Garcia's question is, is that it is significant under this court's case law that the complainant here was an adult and not a child. What if it's, I'm sorry. Was that raised at all at, tr at trials? Can you point to me anything in the record where this issue of whether a vulnerable victim could be an adult was ever discussed by either counsel, by the court, by anybody? The specific question about whether or not the victim was particularly vulnerable was not addressed, but I think that the court grappled well, with the how question. Can we, how can we address it? Isn't, you know, isn't that then an unpreserved issue? I think it's part and parcel of the analysis of whether or not depraved indifference was proven. Um, so, but, but you can't just make a general motion for insufficiency. You have to raise the specific argument that you're making. Right. Was and there the a discussion of the cases that refer to that particular there was not a discussion. Of the, there was not a discussion of the cases, but the court engages in a long colloquy when it discusses its ruling um, and its decision to submit depraved indifference. It says that the people can pursue the alternative theories of an intent and a depraved indifference crime. And it also says that the injuries that occurred here over a long period of time were indicative of depraved indifference, which I think harkens precisely to the type of preservation arguments that were raised in cases like Taylor and Barboni, where this court then addressed these issues. Um, so I don't think that there's a preservation problem to this court addressing it, but, and I also don't think that ultimately this court has to determine whether or not the victim was particularly vulnerable for the reason that the conduct was intentional. But I think this distinction between adults and children is significant. 98 year old Alzheimer's sufferer, not a vulnerable victim because they're an adult? not under this court's precedent. Well, we, we, there has been at least one case where we um, applied it to an adult, and that was the intoxicated adult left Kibbe. by the side of the road, Kibby, right? Right, so, well. So, so the fact that the victim is an adult, it, we haven't said per se prevents this from being applicable. I, th right? I think with respect to the people, I think Kibbe doesn't get them very far. Kibbe, this court actually did not address the sufficiency of depraved indifference. The issue in play there was whether or not there was sufficient causation to sustain the conviction. Kibbe, of course, is also a case in the 1970s. The only other time that this court has applied Kibbe it applied it in Mills. Mills, of course, involved a 12-year-old. 
Um, so we ha so so have we had an opportunity? Have we had a case where we said no? You yes, I think Boosie and I think Taylor and I think other cases subsequent to 2000 when this court's jurisprudence it involved a prolonged. I think the facts in Boosie um, are fairly significant. Boosie involved a um, a significant beating. Um, the complainant was in, wrapped in a carpet, um, put in a trunk, driven 20 miles, and dumped in a, tr in a so, creek. So let me just, under, if I'm understanding uh, the argument, is your argument that if, if, if defendant's conduct is such that uh, he's taking the position, yes, I intended to harm the victim, but I didn't intend to kill them, even if one could infer from the nature of the conduct, in this case, the, the pattern, that appears to be a very severe pattern of injury uh, to this defendant would allow for the inference that the defendant just, as we've said in the cases, didn't care if the victim lived or died, that you, you can't charge them with both and a jury couldn't come to the conclusion no. that, that they're guilty under both? Uh, he cannot be convicted in those circumstances of depraved indifference, again, because the core statutory requirement of depraved indifference must be satisfied and that requires a finding of recklessness. And this court has held that that recklessness is not one of an intent to harm. Um, and I think that's the sort of sole exception to that are these very rare, unique cases involving one-on-one -on -one intentional assaults of children. Um, really, Barboni is the only case in this court's recent jurisprudence of the last 30 years where it's affirmed a conviction along that line, that sole exception. And I, I think it bears mention that exception is in some respects inconsistent with its other jurisprudence involving depraved indifference which, of course, focuses on recklessness. I still have this yeah. fundamental problem with recklessness as to depraved in, recklessness as to creating a grave risk of death and then intent to cause serious physical injury, which is defined as a number of different things, doesn't raise the same issues of being in tension with a depraved indifference to, you know, recklessness and creating this, this grave risk of death that you have in murder cases because the end result is so different. So the concern in the pre-Feingold cases is how can you recklessly create a depraved indifference, you know, recklessly create a grave risk of death, and at the same time, it, the evidence clearly shows you intended to kill. But here we have recklessly create a grave risk of death, and at the same time intend to cause serious physical injury. It's not the same. I, I would respectfully disagree, Your Honor, and I, and I think to take a step back, I, you know, we haven't talked about so the evolution of the jurisprudence, but again, I have to emphasize that the people's theory always was that it was an intentional crime. They specifically said this was not a depraved crime and it wasn't a reckless crime. That's a very different argument. What, what we have here is a jury verdict for, you're, you're switching, I think, a little bit back and forth with this inconsistent verdict argument, but what we have here is a depraved indifference conviction, assault, and can we look at this evidence to say this course of conduct created a grave risk of death, while well, at the same time, this defendant may have intended to inflict serious bodily injury, like, you know, impairment of health, uh, or whatever the terminology is in, in Section 10. Why is that a problem like we had with, you shoot someone five times in the heart, and how could you be indifferent to death when you intended to kill? Well, I think the circumstances as they, as they present themselves in this case show that the same problem is in play. Um, I also think that, again, this court would have to make a decision and reach the question that it didn't reach in Carter, that these are, in fact, consistent counts. And I think there's substantial reasons for them to hold to the contrary. Um, I know that this court addressed Robinson in its decision of matter of Suarez, um, but in Robinson, um, which this court talked about in Trapier, it said, it said that intentional first-degree manslaughter um, was arguably inconsistent with a depraved indifference finding because the result was the same, death, and the result here is serious physical injury. That is the same result of both offenses. Now, I understand your Honor's point about could you have simultaneously been reckless to the grave risk of death, which is, of course, a greater cause, but then I would return to the fact that I don't think that the record supports that. Um, again, it's simply the brain injury, and because that incurred arguably close in time to when the medical professionals arrived on the scene. Actually, I think maybe there are two different results here. One is serious physical injury, and the other is grave risk of death, and I think that's what we're talking about here. I, I would agree, and, and that's the people's position as well, and that's, I think, why they argued that it's it's not, they're not, not 
not an inconsistent verdict insofar he was convicted of intentional second degree assault. But I think no reasonable reading of the record supports that, putting aside the fact, of course, that this court has never convicted, um, upheld a conviction involving an adult complainant in circumstances like these. Thank you, um, counsel. Could I briefly address point two? You, we'll take you on your rebuttal time. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Counsel? Good afternoon, Your Honors. Eric Washer from the Queens County District Attorney's Office. For almost 50 years, this court has recognized that a quintessential example of depraved indifference is a brutal, prolonged course of deliberately injurious conduct inflicted against a particularly vulnerable individual. Importantly, that reasoning has withstood Feingold and Suarez, and it's exactly what happened in this case. The victim, Millie Schinzel, was brutalized for a period of months. She withstood. What do we do about the fact that, that the, the issue of what a particularly vulnerable victim is was not raised down in the lower courts? I think clearly that's not preserved. Um, so there was never that, any. What does that mean? That we then how can we address that argument? Well, I think that specific argument the court should not address at all um, because the defense, defendant didn't raise it below. Uh, he also didn't really raise the issue of what he's saying now is that th he only should have been convicted of intentional crimes. Actually, when you look at the colloquy uh, reg regarding the trial order of the dismissal, the defendant said that the people failed to prove that any of the injuries were inflicted uh, intentionally. So he ass essentially made the exact opposite argument that he's making now. He also said that there was no proof about how any of the injuries were inflicted. And he called into question some of the credibility of the people's witnesses. Yeah, but, but the, the colloquy that follows with the prosecutor is very clear that they're all, at least they are, <laughs> talking about depraved indifference and whether or not there's evidence to, to be able to charge the jury on that. So, right, there, there so is. let's assume for one moment it's preserved. Let's get to that argument here. I guess my difficulty uh, with, with the position, as I understand it in the briefing, is that I, it strikes me that this opens up to uh, a very expansive reading of depraved indifference, which even if much of the jurisprudence is in, as Judge Garcia rightly points out, with situations where someone dies, mm -hmm. and we're talking about death, nevertheless, the, the concern has always run through that jurisprudence that these are, this is a very narrow group of cases. This is not supposed to be a default. Absolutely. Right. So how, how do you address well, that? This for, sounds potentially like it runs in the opposite direction. Well, I don't think it does, Your Honor, because <laughs> back in 1972 in People versus Populous, the people, uh, I'm sorry, this, this court described exactly this set of scenario, this scenario, uh, a long-standing, prolonged, brutal course of intentional conduct done with a conscious objective to harm when the defendant simply doesn't care whether the person lives or dies. And that's exactly what happened in this case. So I, I would resist uh, the well, premise, yeah, yeah, which okay. is that. Well, then, the, I don't think that, well, uh, that's not the point I'm trying to get to. The question is, it, it, let's assume that you establish that, you have the evidence for that, how are you also going to get the intentional assault, right? How, right. How, our, his argument is you can't have the same mens rea. Okay, well, it's you not, can't have these two mens rea, excuse well, it's me. not the same mens rea. And, and because of the result? Yes, because there's two different results. And in Dubry, uh, which is your, yeah. your opinion, you said that that's exactly the holding of Trappier. When there are two different results, you can, uh, two, you can have two different mens reas. Here, it's pretty clear that he intended to injure this person, uh, Millie, and to inflict serious physical injuries. That was the prosecutor's position below. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed position on appeal. But he also recklessly created a grave risk of death. Indeed, the medical testimony was so that So does that she mean that every uh, batterer fits this particular category if they batter their victim so significantly over a period of time? Well, then they would Does that open this up for all these intimate partner violence cases? Well, I think that, that you'd have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, the popless uh, uh, scenario that we've been talking about has existed for 50 years. I don't think there's been a lot of prosecutions like that. I think prosecutors have uh, Understood. I guess my question is, will that change? Let's say we agree uh, with you. And, I, and of course, this is I, I don't an think example of what the people argued. This is her batterer. This was her intimate partner, and this is what he did to her over a very extensive period of time. Certainly, that's the way the judge saw it, given the colloquy. And so does that mean that now this is going to be the way prosecutors will approach these kinds of intimate partner violence cases? 
I don't think so, because I think even the prosecutor understood in this case, she heeded the court's warnings in Suarez and Feingold. She had a reluctance about uh, this charge going to the jury. She cited Busey, and she said, Judge, I I'm concerned that, uh, based on what the Court of Appeals has said, that we might have a problem on appeal, and, and here we are. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> so she yeah, was well, prescient in that respect. Very prescient, uh, that's yeah. true. If, if she had died, this would be then a at depraved, that point, indifference, murder prosecution. It's one or the other. One. You agree that at that point it's one or the other. It's either intentional or depraved indifference? Oh, I think it would be a depraved died. indifference murder. I think it would, be a, would have been a difficult but That's what I'm saying. You'd have to choose one or the other, decide which way you were going to proceed. Yes. yes. And, and but counsel, it's different. If you're taking your argument as I understand it, as I understand that argument with the two different results, you don't need the vulnerable victim exemption. No. You're no. just looking at sufficiency. Yes. And I think the answer to can you do this all the time is you always will have a sufficiency review and you always, it seems to me, will have what Feingold was saying, which is wherever this depraved indifference language appears in the statute, you have to prove it as a mens rea. Yes, and it's a very high bar. You have to show literal indifference to the fate of the victim. And yes, that's a hard thing case, to prove. Yes, but in this case, as I understand it, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, that boils down to a pattern of physical violence against her. Yes, it took her to the point of almost death. Thank goodness they got there in time. And I'm asking you, how is that different for a category of intimate partner cases where that's exactly what the batterer does? violent abuse over a period of time. Those survivors describe basically being in a terrorist environment. So how is it different? Well, I think those cases could be charged as depraved and different assaults, and or I think that would be appropriately be so. based upon her brain injury and the fact that at least for a period well, of hours, maybe days, when people could hear her moaning incoherently yes. on the phone, that that in and, in and of itself could make her a particularly vulnerable victim? But yes. Not, uh, leaving aside whatever beatings and whatever yeah. broken bones, whatever happened before that, just that very thing that he continued uh, to, to beat her once she was no longer mentally. Well, that, that's certainly a factor that makes, made her particularly vulnerable towards the end. I thought she your point was you didn't have to show she's particularly we, vulnerable. We don't. I did want to address uh, Judge Garcia's point because we don't. And this court uh, in Barboni and, and Heidgen made clear that although there are some quintessential examples of depraved indifference, there's no exhaustive list. Uh, the, the bottom line finding and the thing that's most difficult is literal indifference to whether the victim lives or dies. And so that's what we have to prove, vulnerable victim or no. So even if we hadn't had that, we still would have had the pattern of abuse going for months and bringing her quite literally to the brink of death. So even if the court is disinclined to make a finding that she was a particularly vulnerable victim, that doesn't mean that we didn't establish depraved indifference. I do so want to then, talk will that, as you say, it may open it up to these other cases, will that then come down to how severe is the physical abuse every time? Uh, for the, for in these intimate partner cases where you have that pattern of physical violence throughout? No, I think it's going to come down to the state of mind of, uh, of the defendant. Whether it's but don't you draw that out because of this pattern of conduct? Of course, it doesn't matter to me if, if they live or die. The, that's what the majority said in Barboni. When you have a pattern going on for weeks or months, then the actor has the opportunity to say, maybe I should get some help for this person, or to reflect on what he's doing. And that's what makes it so egregious in this case. It went on and on and on, and he never stopped until she was just about to die, and the mother was calling, the bishops from the church were calling, and he knew at that point that he had to get her some help, I think, or that the police were going to. So the record is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, establishes that there were a series of assaults over a long period of time. We've been talking about that all afternoon. Is there record support for the following conclusion by the jury, that one of the assaults was intentional and the rest were not, but were depraved indifference? Would that well, be supported? I don't think those findings are mutually exclusive. That's I think what I'm what asking. Right, the jury could have reasonably found that there was a series of intentional assaults that in the end amounted to depraved indifference. In other words, that he was recklessly creating a grave risk of death and that while he was doing that, he was literally indifferent to whether she lived or died. Uh, I do Counsel, wanna... do you care to address the jury note issue? Yes, um, just, just briefly. Um, I know uh, what, what the uh, defendant, or what the jury asked in this case was, why the uh, grand jury prosecutor had been dismissed. And both sides and the court looked at the record, and there was no testimony to that effect. Um, 
And so that was the answer, ultimately, that the court gave. It didn't supplement the record, uh, the record, and I know of no case that would require the judge to have done so. Um, if the defendant in this case wanted the reason uh, for the prosecutor's recusal to be on the record, he had to ask about it, um, and he didn't. So I certainly don't think the judge abused his discretion uh, in the way that he Did answered the, the question. Did the judge erroneously um, uh, assume that he had to get the consent of both? No, I, I think if you read that uh, discussion in context, all he was saying is that if I'm going to tell the jury something that's not in evidence, I want both sides to agree or to stipulate to that. And the prosecutor didn't agree that that was an answer that she felt should be given under the circumstances. And so the court didn't do it. And I think that was particularly, I think that was perfectly reasonable under the circumstances. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honors. Counsel? Just a few brief points. Um, one, I realize that the people's position is that, you know, th that they proved utter indifference to life and notwithstanding the tragic nature of the injuries here, I think it bears mention that there were efforts by the appellant to communicate that the complainant had been injured. Um, he said this to her mother. He said this to um, the bishops. And when the EMTs arrived, he suggested that she be taken to the hospital. I, I mention these facts only because of this court's opinion in Louis and this court's opinion in Matos. Um, of course, efforts to conceal a crime cannot be used as proof of depraved indifference, nor can an inability to render timely medical assistance. Um, and so I think in those respects, um, while I recognize that the cases are factually this case is factually distinguishable from Matos and Louis, I think that those bear emphasis um, because they don't support a conclusion that he was utterly indifferent to whether she lived or died. Um, I think, as just to reiterate Justice R Judge Rivera's points, um, there is a real floodgates concern here. Um, this court's efforts since Suarez have been to cabin depraved indifference to only the rarest of circumstances. Um, I think the people point out why this is an unusual case, but I do think that we'll encourage twin count indictments in more circumstances, particularly where this court gives a green light for the people to do so. Um, that was precisely the, cur the con sort of situation. I thought that in those cases Suarez. the court was really concerned with these people were being convicted of depraved indifference murder when they weren't guilty of that. There was insufficient evidence to support it because clearly they intentionally murdered someone. But here, I don't think the concern is just you'll have more depraved indifference convictions that are supported by the evidence. I mean, this is just so different to me. So it isn't the concern that, oh, you shot someone five times in the heart and now they're compromising on, you know, depraved indifference. It's that the proof in cases particularly with beatings and not involving deadly weapons where the victim survives more naturally fits a, over a course of time beatings naturally fits a depraved indifference count so we weren't so concerned with the numbers that people guilty of depraved indifference but we have so many convictions it was that it didn't fit the facts didn't fit under a sufficiency theory so where they do where you have this type of, it isn't just we don't want a lot of depraved indifference convictions. I respectfully disagree. I think Suarez makes clear that depraved indifference only applies to a limited category of offenses, and that was the legislature's original intent. And I think as to your point, um, there is a concern here because Again, depraved indifference is supposed to apply in situations not involving intentional the conduct. The language I think in Suarez was where there's a deadly attack with a knife or gun or similar attack or something like that. So these cases where you have beatings, particularly beatings over time, raise these issues I think that we've been discussing which really go to how do you read the proof that you can intend to harm someone but the repetitive nature of those injuries indicates a reckless creation of a grave risk of death which to me just fundamentally, I know we're beating horse here, but seems so different than I shot someone five times in the heart and now I want to be convicted of reckless, you know, I don't want to be convicted of recklessly creating a grave risk of death for that. I, I think the practical effect is the same. And I think that this court could hold that way, but doing so would be contrary to its prior precedent and would open up the door to, I think, a plethora of depraved indifference charges, precisely the scenario that Suarez was designed to prevent. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honors.